Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Please come in. Come in. Hi. Come sit up over here in the front. No? You're OK. All right. <laughs> I, I like to be able to see people's faces. Are we ready to go, JP? We are ready to go. So hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm Jessica Green. And together with Reverend Dr. Zena Jacques and Claire Nelson, we welcome you to Courageous Conversations, presented by Urban Consulate with Barrington's White House. Um, welcome to everyone both here in person, and we have a whole group of people live streaming um, from home. We're thrilled to be gathering monthly every second Wednesday of uh, the month to continue learning and practicing how to foster greater inclusion and belonging in our communities. You would think I'd have this memorized by now, but I don't. <laughs> We are both recording and streaming this conversation tonight and we'll open for questions from both in-person and virtual guests later this evening. So as you listen to our guests, please be thinking of your questions. Um, before we introduce tonight's guests, we are so excited about upcoming speakers. Um, so please mark your calendars and invite a friend for the following events. Next month in April, the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, How the Word is Passed, a reckoning with the history of slavery across America, Clint Smith, will be joining us in a special hybrid event with cameras both here in Barrington and Zena will be in DC with Clint. So we are very excited to do this kind of cross city thing. We're hoping it goes okay. I'm gonna be all well, alone. Well, I'm gonna miss you. It will go well. Yeah, it's gonna be amazing. So show up, bring friends. It's gonna be so exciting. Um, we can't believe we got Clint because he's Truly, he is very in demand right now. In May, we have invited Reverend Jen Bailey, the co-founder of People Supper. The, um, oh, she is uh, very excited to join us from Nashville, Tennessee. And so that's going to be an event in person here in Barrington. And we will be having dinner together and uh, practicing the People's Supper model, uh, which we wanted to do two years ago when we first launched the program, Courageous uh, Year of Courageous Conversations. But of course, we couldn't because of COVID. So we're happy to be able to follow through with that now. Um, if you were one of the 67 million people who watched Made on Netflix, you'll know why we were excited to welcome Stephanie Land, author of the New York Times bestselling book, Made, Hard Work, Low Pay, and a Mother's Will to Survive later this year. So she'll be coming in the fall. Tickets are available at CourageousCommunity.us or on Barrington White House's website. Your ticket purchases help produce this series, so thank you for helping to make this possible. If you know anyone who would love to join for whom cost might be a barrier. We offer complimentary tickets every month, so please let people know there is uh, no reason required to get a complimentary ticket, so just ask. Every month we hold the same grounding virtues for gathering from our friends at On Being, and they are words matter, mm -hmm. hospitality, humility, patience, generous listening, and adventurous civility. So we hope you keep those in mind tonight. Our topic is uncovering hidden violence against women. The pandemic has been especially challenging for women and children who are not safe at home, and our community is not immune. How can we break the cycle of domestic violence? We are honored to welcome tireless advocate for families confronting domestic violence, Rebecca Dar. She has been a WINGS leader for nearly 24 years. Dar was named CEO of Wings in 2014 after serving as the agency's executive director for 15 years. Under Dar's leadership, Wings has dramatically increased its ability to serve the needs of families in crisis because of domestic violence. The agency has tripled in size and secured new funding sources, including four resale stores that generate revenue to support Wings programs. Dar led the Wings team in building the first domestic violence shelter in Chicago's northwest suburbs in 2005. This shelter has since helped thousands of women and children move from abuse to freedom. She also played a key role in the 2016 opening of the Wings Metro Shelter on Chicago's southwest side. Dar is closely involved with numerous organizations and task forces committed to leading the fight to enact stronger legislation and to secure increased resources to combat domestic violence. Welcome, Rebecca. And also with us tonight is Sarah McClary. We are thrilled to have you here as well. Founder of Operation Shelter Cupid, which was recently featured in People Magazine. 
In 2005, Sarah woke up in a domestic violence shelter on Valentine's Day and decided that she needed to feel some beauty and love. She came to the wing shelter that year with her one and two-year-old sons. After having been hospitalized, and becoming homeless due to her own experience with domestic violence. Sarah graduated from the WINGS program in 2007, and after that, she maintained relationships with other residents and graduates to foster a sense of community and belonging for domestic violence survivors. She started visiting support groups at the WINGS shelter, and um, she wants to continue to do that because she wants to encourage the women, and particularly because of the community that that is necessary to continue to build. She founded Operation Shelter Cupid and WINGS Alumni Association in 2011. Sarah also served on the WINGS Board of Directors from 2007 to 2012. Sarah is currently leading the community outreach ministry at her church. She developed a partnership with the village of Hoffman to bring aid to those in our community who have needs that cannot be met by other agencies. And recently, Sarah obtained a 501c3 approval for Dynamis House, which will be a transitional house that serves domestic violence victims using the trafficking addiction recovery model, recruiting residents from Chicago land and uh, domestic violence shelters. Welcome, Sarah. Now it's my pleasure to hand it off to uh, Reverend Zena. Good evening, everybody. I, I want you to try a little experiment with me before we begin this amazing evening. And I, I, I can tell you, you will leave here transformed. You will leave um, the virtual space transformed. But here's what I want you to do. I'm not going to ask you to share this at all. So this is just to remember in your own heart and mind. Can you uh, remember and place yourself in a moment in your history when you were feeling incredible pressure and you couldn't make a decision? There was so much coming at you, so many variables, so many possibilities, but they weren't necessarily good. And you might even have felt frozen, the absence of agency to move forward. Can you, can you just, just sit in that for 20 seconds, a kind of feeling of, I don't know what to do. And then, the moment when you did figure out what to do. Someone came along to help you or your own wisdom rose up and you were able to move out of that space into the next space. What happens in your body when you are able to move on, when you're able to rise up? It wasn't easy to begin with, but you got there. So often, in our society, we view people who are in the midst of that moment of being without all the agency necessary to move beyond a space of violence. And we say, just come on now. But if you've had a moment, no matter how small or how large, when you couldn't do it, multiply it by a thousand. And you'll know a taste of the feeling of what it is to be locked in a space without the wherewithal in that moment to move forward. Tonight, in this brave space, in this space where we will invite you to, to hear the stories, and, and we say at Courageous Communities, the stories and the lessons you learn, we invite you to take the lessons out, but the stories remain. So there's a confidentiality here that honors the stories by which you and I will be blessed tonight. But the lessons you find, yes, take those out. So come, come into this space that may invite you again into that moment of not knowing the agency. But come into this space knowing that tonight our goal with these two amazing women, I wanna grow up and be her. 
I've, I've told Rebecca this on numerous occasions. When I grow up, I'm older than she, but when I grow up, I will be Rebecca Bell. Um, you, you, will, you will find what it is to be without hope and then be transformed into the bringer of hope because that's what these stories will offer tonight. So we are delighted that you have chosen to come and be present and we are delighted for the stories of agency and blessing that are about to pour forth. Join me in welcoming our sisters again. Thank you. Thank you, Zena and Sarah and Rebecca. So I'm excited and interested and eager to hear from both of you on the personal calling to this work um, as it touches you each um, of breaking cycles of violence. So, Sarah, would you like to start? Yeah. So, as they said, I, um, I moved into the wing shelter just a couple months after she built it. And so, um, <laughs> um, I, had, I had gotten married when I was very young. I was, I was 18 years old. And um, in, in my personal story, the, the physical violence started almost immediately. And, and I tolerated it immediately. Didn't even think a thing about it. Um, and uh, at that time, I, I didn't really hear the term domestic violence, or I didn't really label myself as a, as a victim. Um, but it escalated, and you know, I, you know, things got increasingly worse for me. Um, I had I had several miscarriages. I I, um, I had I had two sons back to back, and then um, my husband attacked me when I was pregnant with my third son, and that resulted in his death, which um, put me in the hospital. And that was the rock bottom I hit that um, propelled me to to leave and, and choose homelessness over staying where I was at. Um, prior to that, I uh, didn't really have any, any means to go anywhere and um, didn't have any support built up to help me. And, but at that point, um, I would have chosen um, death over staying or going back home. So it, it became more desirable to, to be homeless with my kids um, at that point. So. We were looking for a place to get into for a while, um, and a lot of the shelters were filled up at that time. And finally, um, I got into Wings. They had an open bed for us. And so I got a lot of help and support. I started school at Harper College when I was there. I got accepted into transitional housing. Um, and I just, I was so driven be just because of how bad things had gotten for me in the past. And so my, in my mind, my two choices were, were either death or moving forward. And so. Um, I just didn't stop at anything. I wanted to make sure that I could be independent and support my kids myself so that I would never have to like depend on somebody again and be um, at their mercy. And so I graduated in 07 and then part of that's why I just stay so involved because um, my life changed so much and I never in a, a million years would have thought that I'd be living the life I do now, you know, um, we're sitting here doing this. And um, I bought a house, you know, my, my kids are doing great. And, um, but that's why I keep going back. Um, and also, coincidentally, I had been volunteering for a few years at the, the Willow Creek Care Center doing one-on-one -on -one counseling with people who were seeking help. And one real eye-opener for me was that the two of my most extreme cases that I ever saw of people that were suffering the absolute worst conditions, we had to get professionals on site immediately for it, um, were from Barrington and were, were wealthy. And, that really changed my opinions because you know I you think of wealthy communities as as not having those types of problems or anything and so that really gave me that kind of opened up my heart to a lot more people and, mm -hmm. and understanding to a lot more people but typically I stay involved with you know people in the shelter but thank you Sarah Rebecca so I when I grow up I want to be like her yeah <laughs> This woman is one of the most tenacious, amazing, caring, persistent person that I know. And I take every bit of advice that she gives me, and she's given me a lot along the way, so I appreciate that. Um, I always knew from the time I was a little child that I would go into the caring profession because I had a grandmother in a small town who would always give the, the coat off of her back to anybody who wanted it a mother who was very much the same, and a, a father who taught me how to have fun. 
And um, when I chose my career path as psychology and I got my degree in clinical psychology, working with kids that had been physically and sexually abused, and then ultimately when we moved to this area and I found uh, Rita Canning and Wings um, and saw at that time Wings was very small. Uh, we only had two homes. There was no safe house for people like Sarah to go to. And Rita and I just set about making, a ch making that change. And so um, it wasn't easy, but once we started doing the work and we, we saw the impact that it had, not just for Sarah, but for her boys, who are doing phenomenally well. We are honoring them. They are our VIP guests at our sports luncheon on Monday where we have the owners of the sports teams who are secondary to these VIP guests <laughs> um, because of everything they've accomplished and the resources and it takes to make these types of things happen um, is not one person. Um, it does take a village and Barrington has always been um, a village that's been behind the work that we do. Some of you may or may not know that we actually have a home here in Barrington that was part of the big controversy in 1999 when the helicopters were flying around after the uh, Columbine incident and the family had bought a house for their kids to, to park next to the high school. Uh, those doctors gave that house to us 20 years ago and we still have it today. Oh. And we have homes, and that's a home that, um, did, you, did you live in that one? No, no, you didn't live in that one. Um, so it, it's helped hundreds of families right here in, that have come and made Barrington their home. So, you know, it's it's an honor to do the work. Um, it's there are days that are grind, and my husband can attest to those. <laughs> but at the end of the day, when you know that you're making a difference in people's lives, and then they can go make a difference as Sarah's doing in other people's lives, that's what it's all about. Rebecca, domestic violence occurs in many guises, um, hides behind many doors. What, what can you share with us about the face of domestic violence? Well, Sarah shared her story of the physical violence. And, and when people hear the words domestic violence, they pretty much always go to the physical. And, and it is common. What is even more common that people are not uh, aware of is financial abuse. In 99% of the cases, um, not just that we see, but in the research across the country, and all state is a leader in this uh, research and has a financial curriculum uh, to help people, 99% um, of people who are in experiencing domestic violence, it's financial abuse. And what that means is that it's, domestic violence is really power and control the need for one individual to have power and control over another. And sometimes they do that with physical means, sometimes they do that with, it's called gaslighting, you may have heard this term before, where they will you know, berate them, call them names, keep them up all night so that they can't be you know, productive at work. Um, but the financial abuse is, is purposeful because if you don't have money and you don't have access to money, how do you leave? And as Sarah said, your, your options are homelessness, in many cases, it's not safe to go to family members' homes. You're putting them in jeopardy. Um, the other piece is that the most dangerous time for any victim is when they're trying to leave. Mm -hmm. For the simple, obvious reason that the other individual is losing control over them. And so when you see someone, uh, we just celebrated, not celebrated, we just honored the legacy of Cindy Bischoff, a Barrington resident who was killed March 7th in 2008. And, um, you know, it was senseless. It could have completely been prevented, um, but the courts did not protect her. And so that was that is what happened. So, you know, it's it starts with something that just as simple as isolation. And a lot of people don't realize that, you know, I had a family member who got into a relationship. She didn't have a driver's license for a whole host of reasons. And what her husband said to her was, oh, honey, you don't need a driver's license. I love you so much. I'll always drive you anywhere you want to go. So she only went where he let her go. And, that, and that's not something you call the police to say, my husband won't let me drive a car. So it's, and then he isolated her from family and friends. It was a rural community, which was very easy to do. Um, and she ultimately finally did get out of the relationship 17 years later 
but it, and he never was physically violent. He never hit her, but it was all emotional and it was all controlling, controlling behavior. He did put all of his assets in his father's name so that when she left him, that's another piece of financial abuse that people don't realize happens a lot, so that when she left him, she had nothing. So. It's, it's invisible in communities like this, why? Why is it invisible? I get the calls, we have a hotline, um, but it's typical because I've been a, a member of the Barrington Junior Women's Club since, ninth, since I moved here in 1998. Um, and so I, I know a lot of people through juniors and typically if someone hears of someone who's experiencing something going on in their home, um, they don't feel comfortable calling the hotline, which is what I usually advise them to do um, because it's confidential and it's safe and, and they have access to all kinds of resources. Um, but I've gotten over the years many calls from people in Barrington and it's the stigma that still exists and that the notion that I must have done something to deserve this. Mm. And I will tell you, and Sarah will, will tell you also about you know, this whole concept of why doesn't she or he just leave. Um, it's not that simple. And it's even more complicated um, if you are living in a wealthy community and you have no money and no access to money, and your friends don't know it. I've had people, a person from Barrington, call me with a friend whose husband would not let her have the medication that she needed. He kept her sick so that she couldn't leave. It's stuff like that that kind of happens behind the doors that people don't see. Um, I do appreciate, though, that people in Barrington will pick up the phone and call for someone else, and then we can give them support on what to do. Can you talk us through a little bit more about, um, you said the stigma or maybe shame that's attached and affiliated to the experience um, when you are a victim of, of abuse and um, how that manifests, what that looks like for, for those of us who or maybe friends or in community and what we can look out for in order to be able to support. You want to take that one? Or me? Um, I, I think it might depend on the, the community and the, and the type of, of person you're dealing with, but um, I think like Rebecca said that um, the shame is, is a really big piece um, and, and we want to, in different ways, all of us can relate to wanting to project an image that, oh, you know, I'm doing fine, everything's great. I'm sure everyone in this room can relate to that on a certain level, maybe not to, to an extreme situation like that, but, um, and people have other reasons, like, you know, if they, if they have a standing in the community or they have a reputation that they wanna maintain, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that's, that's big. Um, it probably looks different in different places, though. Mm -hmm. so. so you talk about, um, <clears throat> the cost of, of getting yourself into safety and the amount that goes into not just getting yourself out of the situation, but then, you know, when we were doing our pre-call, you talked a lot about the healing process and how much time that takes as well. And um, also, you know, the other financial support needed in order to just stay stable. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about that aspect. Do you want me to start? Okay. Um, yeah, so the financial part or the, just the leaving in general? The, the financial part. So, you know, obviously starting all over from scratch and having, you know, the clothes on your back, you having kids, you know, they have diapers and you need food. Um, that's the immediate cost, which is everything. And, um, but the recovery is a long, is a very long road. And, and Rebecca will tell you, you know, the, the two year programs. They're not enough time, really. You know, we we need support beyond two years, um, just just to have, you know, people around us that, that can help. Um, because there's the unpacking all the trauma and still trying to get an education so that you're able to provide for your family, trying to hold down a job and hold it together for your job and hold it together for your kids. It kind of extends the recovery process, and um, you know, transitional housing. That was I was there for two years and had a caseworker that I really needed to have in my life and. That's a salary, you know, and mm -hmm. you want to talk? 
Well, she's right. I mean, and diff it's different for different people, and, and she's recognized that in going back to the safe house, and, and, the, and she'll talk about the trends that she sees. Um, and we have some people that, you know, are coming in not at zero, but like a thousand feet below, mm -hmm. and and everything that they need to get back on their feet. Um, it, we had a, I had a, a personal situation. My husband and I helped one of my kids' friends uh, in a situation with the. Uh, be she became homeless, but she was also in an abusive relationship. But she wasn't going to go back to her same landlord who wasn't fixing things. And she had a housing choice voucher, so she really didn't need to come into shelter. She just needed a landlord to take the voucher. And we went through 25 landlords, $10,000 in storing her stuff so she didn't have to start over um, hotel room while her son stayed with us. And um, people don't realize that, you know, and that's part of the you know, why doesn't she just leave? If you don't have anything, what are you leaving? You know, you, Sarah left yeah. everything behind. So you, you really are starting over with nothing. So the space that we've tried to create at Wings, and, and Sarah's going to talk about her program she's launching called Dynamus, was really, you know, we were forced to take HUD funding. And when you're forced to take government funding, um, is it tells you how you're going to do things. And the transitional housing money is, lim is two year time limited. Mm -hmm. So we did go try to seek other funding for permanent supportive housing for individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and other anxiety that they could stay for as long as they wanted. Those dollars are severely limited. And so, you know, to, to Sarah's point, trying to create spaces where we can help people for a longer time um, one of the things that we're trying and, and Sarah's been helping with is to launch, uh, we've always had a mentoring program called Project Lifeline, but to, it's morphed because of Sarah and other survivors into a survivor mentor program. So it's, we launched it uh, with monies from the Cindy Bischoff Memorial Fund, ironically. Mike Bischoff, her brother, gave us seed money to start to pilot this program last year in Chicago. And we're matching survivors with uh, uh, victims coming from shelters all over Chicago into new housing units that we just secured. And that's a model that we want to see. That way the mentor could stay with them mm -hmm. long after case management is no longer there um, to provide emotional and, and just technical support on the next part of that person's journey. So, you know, the, always trying to find ways, and, and Sarah's creating Dynamis out of her own experience, of, like she's saying, you know, when they get into the, the safe houses, we're forced to immediately get them right. to thinking about where are you going to live next right. and how are you going to pay for where you're living right. next and what job are you going to get to pay for that? And there's all that pressure and, you know, I'll let you speak to how that experience yeah. you know, was for you. Yeah, I'll, that, that's what led me to launch the new nonprofit um, because I've, I've been visiting the, the shelter for uh, since 2007 and talked to hundreds and hundreds of other survivors and this is an extremely common thing but my story as well um, you know I was I was a high performer when I was in wings because I was so driven um, but it was all about you know I have to survive I have to survive I have to, survive, I have to make money I have to um, and so when I graduated I graduated from Harper and from wings at the same time I got out on my own and it, outwardly I was like oh I'm successful everything's better now you know my life has changed um, but a couple years into that, um, I got diagnosed with PTSD because when the dust settles, mm -hmm. all that stuff that you're, you know, that you're stuffing down in there and, and, you know, it comes back. And, and I've, I've just known hundreds of people that have the, the same pattern. And I'm like, something's got to be, you know, we got to do something different. And, um, and so I, I learned a whole lot going to therapy and getting like support, long, longer term support. And I learned a lot about trauma. And so, uh, one thing I noticed is that in, um, uh, addiction programs and sex trafficking programs, there's an acknowledgement that the person has like a debilitating condition that's so severe that they have to get intensive care first before they go into work in school. But with domestic violence, because of the way the funding works, you know, it's, you know, oh, you have a place to live and you need to immediately start working and going to school. So I, I feel like if we can, you know, serve domestic violence victims in the way we serve sex trafficking victims and give them the space and time to really heal and address the trauma mm -hmm. so that they're more stabilized first and then go into it. 
um, that's my I, that's my goal. So, Rebecca, can we talk about root causes? Why did why does this happen? What what causes someone to move to be an abuser? Well, I think the important thing is to remember that uh, behavior is learned. Hmm. Behavior can be unlearned. Um, if you look at the bully on the playground, that child has probably been abused or hurt, and therefore they're hurting someone else. So, you know, it, it seems very obvious, and Sarah's gonna also talk about this a little bit in terms of patterns. Um, but it, it, if you take a step back and, and look at it from more of a global level, it, it isn't so confusing that an individual is hurting another, other, another individual or have, needing control over another individual because of something they've been through. And there is also, it, it, mental illness does play a, a part in some cases, addiction plays a part in some cases, um, but the ultimate behavior of actually acting on um, threats, intimidation, physical violence, uh, emotional violence to be able to feel better about yourself um, is, and, and it ultimately doesn't. I, I've, I've taught actually abuser classes and, and there are, they are available in Illinois. Um, they're not long enough, but that's another battle. We'll fight it another day. But it, they can get treatment. And so, you know, if someone finds themselves in a relationship and they, they re recognize this isn't the person I want to be, they can call the statewide hotline and they can get help too. So, and, and people sometimes do that, but most cases it's the courts that force them into that treatment. Um, and Illinois does not do a good job of holding them accountable for following through with that treatment. But it's the ones that actually seek the treatment voluntarily that you see a huge shift in, they see a shift in themselves, and they move forward to healthier relationships. And that's ultimately the goal. You know, for us, we're working to try to break the cycle for, for the kids that are with us, and we have a very comprehensive children's program um, that they grow up to have healthy relationships. And you couple that with uh, people like Sarah who, who do everything they can and for their children, and she has very wonderful young men. They are very tall young men um, <laughs> who have healthy relationships, mm -hmm. and they're not going to repeat that cycle. And you know, I'll let you talk about you know, like what you were talking about on the call about knowing growing up with and repeating so what for, you know. Yeah, for for people being abused, um, you know, we we all form relational templates when we're growing up, and the way we related to our parents and the and the patterns we saw modeled like intrinsically teach us what's normal and what our role is and, and how to interact with other people. And you know, I had said that I, I tolerated violence like right from the beginning and I, it didn't strike me as um, a problem because I, I just had, I had learned that that was just normal. And so um, you know, people who, who uh, end up in, re in these types of relationships, if you get to know them often, you know, it, it, there's a very similar pattern with that. And, and it takes a lot to, um, unravel all that and understand, because that, that deals with identity, it deals with um, just rela relational patterns, and it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of stuff to unpack. It's like kind of unlearning everything you know and relearning it, but um, I, would, I would guess that, that most people that end up being abused as adults probably had experienced it as kids. That was my, my experience, um, and many, many people that I've known, but once again, it's a learned so breaking the, um, the cycle begins, we have this, we, we were talking about this metaphor, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, so we'll circle back for sure. Don't worry, we'll cover more stuff. But we were talking on our pre-call um, with regards to um, the metaphor of an of a upstream-downstream kind of, kind of river, right? Where there are some cases where we can be proactive in order to break cycles, and then there are other situations where we have to be reactive. And so um, one of the um, examples you gave, Rebecca, was that um, abusers can unlearn this behavior, which I, I'll talk about my own bias. Um, that really, when you said that to me, it was like, whoa, of, of, course, of course that can happen. And then that felt really promising to me. So talk to me about what data you have um, or the studies that have um, 
validated the amount of time needed in order for there to be a real shift in behavior and why Illinois is maybe too short on, on that. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? I, um, I did my, uh, Joe and I, my husband and I moved to California, went to U of I. Woohoo! Yay, um, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> they won the game the other night. Um, and we have three boys there now, so that's really crazy. But uh, anyway, when we graduated and he finished his master's program, we moved to, to San Jose, California for six years. While he, and he worked in GE out there in power systems. And um, I finished my master's degree and did my internships out there. And one of the internships I did was the abuser treatment um, classes. So these were men and women who were court mandated um, after an incident. So in California, uh, back then in, what was that, 1992, 93, um, had already enacted legislation that said a, a victim did not have to press charges. If a, if a call was made to the police, even if a third party called, um, charges were automatically filed. The, the victim was never put in the position of having to say yes or no, I want to press charges. And then what happened after that, the courts and uh, probation, law enforcement, and treatment providers like the one I interned with were very well coordinated and they had two weeks to get enrolled into an abu abuser treatment class. And, it, and they were 32 weeks in California at that time. Now this was 20 years ago. And, and the way it works in pretty much every state is that the state legislature approves a curriculum so everybody's using the same thing to teach the abusers to recognize their issues around power and control. And that, and that it's about them and not about she didn't get dinner on the, the mm -hmm. table fast enough. And as we were going through these, uh, they were co-facilitated by men and women. And it, it was very interesting and a great learning experience. But we always got, when we got to the 30th of a 32-week program, we had a full, full room of so the ones who made it that far. Mm -hmm. There were ones who made probation reports and they didn't make it to the end. They went to sit in jail for a couple of weeks and decide if they wanted to try again. Um, but this was a diversion to keep people out of jail and give them a chance to get treatment to be better people, be different people. And at the 30th week, we just had a room full of sobbing men. Mm. I don't want to be this way. I never wanted to be like my father. I, I want to be a better husband. And, and it was over in two weeks. Mm -mm. So And we saw everybody across the state saw the same thing. And we went to Sacramento and we... Uh, asked for legislation to make it a 52-week program, and they did. So California's had a 52-week program since then. Minnesota does, Colorado does. Those are the three progressive states um, in the research and, and development of programming uh, in this area. The power and control will actually came out of Duluth, Minnesota, um, which was really interesting. Um, but when, when I came here to Illinois, I found out that the program, mandated program in Illinois is 26 weeks. So you miss that window of the 30th week where they really get it to their core that it's about them. Mm. And they have the power to change them. And that's what we really have to work on in Illinois is to get it to 52 weeks. And we need to get the courts to take it serious. The courts do not. We still, this week, had a judge ask a client, well, what, what did you say to make him do that? Still... And, and it comes from we don't have, um, now I'm off on a complete tangent, but um, judges are the only, and there's good judges and there's bad judges, just like there is in every profession. Um, there's, you know, it's just a function, but for them it's really a function of lack of training in the area of domestic violence. So if they haven't gone through the statewide 40-hour domestic violence training, they're not always certain what they're looking at. Mm. And so it's not so much a bias as it is an education issue. And they're elected officials. So, you know, a lot of people elect people without knowing what their education level is around domestic violence. So, mm. but. This upstream, downstream. Mm -hmm. So the downstream part of that is when we're plucking, not, not we, but when we're identifying somebody in the middle of it, right? Mm -hmm. This is, there's nothing to, it's, it's happening. What would you tell us to look for? What are there warning signs? Are there, are you've t you've said several times that friends have called about friends. Mm -hmm. What do you want us train us tonight? What do what should we be aware of? Are, are, what are the moments that we might preempt something by calling the hotline? Um, 
So, yeah, you know, we talked earlier, I mean, certainly the, the isolation. Um, and literally, this just happened last night that I had a mother call me whose daughter had met a man online. She went to stay with him, and almost immediately, he said, you're not, you don't need to go home to see your mother. And this is like Oswego, someplace not close, down by Starve Rock State Park. And, and the, the girl, she's young, was completely afraid because she's like, why are you not letting me go see my mom? And she convinced him to bring her back up here because she needed to get some clothes. And the mom called and she said, well, he's going to come back and pick her up on Saturday. And I said, no, he's not. <laughs> if she got away, she's not going back. And she'd only been with him a month. But, you know, so, you know, I instructed her on, on calling the police there and telling them what was going on. And, and they helped her get her things and get her back here. And we'll help her with housing and stuff. But it, it really is if, you know, and this mom saw it immediately that mm -hmm. just by him saying that, you know, you can't, you don't need to go see your family. It goes, honey, I love you so much. This happens a lot in high school relationships. Mm. And we, when we talk to teens about it, it's the you know, teenage relationship. You, know, you don't need to hang out with those friends. You've got me now. Mm. I love you so much. Why do you need to go be with them? You, you can just hang out with me all the time. It's isolation in the name of love. So I, would, I would add to that. Um, you also have to be really careful because um, the, a lot of, the woman has to be ready, yeah, and so um, a lot of times this this was my case when you know when I was in this situation, and I've I've been within friendships and fam family relationships where other people were being abused, and we knew it, and and the the woman um, was not ready, and and not and you can turn them against you if you try to if you try to step in and say well you know you're going to do this and, and we're going to move you here and do this and they don't want to yet for mm -hmm. other for various reasons mm -hmm. um, then that burns a bridge mm -hmm. and so you have to be that cuz they already are being controlled and it's hard to um, engage with people like people who are legal adults but don't have like agency over themselves because you can't legally do things for them because they're an autonomous person mm -hmm. so be, mind, be mindful of, of how they're reacting to your help. That's exactly right. And that's why when someone calls me my first, and, and so I have had that where someone said, I'm going to drive to their house and get right. them and bring them here. And, and I said exactly what to them. I said, no, one, you're putting yourself in danger. But two, that may not be what they want. So let them, and the nice thing about the hotline, and they can, and they can call wings too and just talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, and, and we have people in the hospitals, we have someone who ends up in the emergency department and it's because of domestic violence, they get referred to one of our counselors. A lot of times that counselor, uh, that the, it's not safe right. in that situation, that if they leave, it's they're gonna be in more danger and they know that. Yeah. Or as Sarah said, they're not ready yeah. to do that. It takes they, time. They, they need time to do that, but they can have somebody to talk to and. We have one woman from the hospital who talked to her counselor for a year and then decided the time was right for her. I, I would add that's, that's a really smart thing if you want to help someone that you know is being abused and, and they're not cooperating with wanting to leave yet. It's, it's really, really important that they know that, that you're there for them and not judging them and that you're still going to be for the, there for them next month and next month. And over time, when, when they are ready, that can help build their confidence. And then when they are ready, then they have an avenue out. So being present with them. Yeah, and, it, and it's hard because, you know, none of us want to to just stand by and watch something like that happen, but the most important thing is maintaining that, that line with that with that person. Mm -hmm. And so they, because they, I've, I cut off family members that were trying to yank me out when, you know, and um, and then I, I was like, that isolated me more. You know, they're not, they don't have my back, they're not in my corner. You know, I wanted my marriage to work, you know, and... So, you know, they're against me now and they, you know, they're mad at me and um, that can become even more isolating. So it's so important to just to, to be a, a safe person for them over time. And, it, and it's very difficult, especially if it's someone that you really love so hard to, to do that. But it's really important. Rebecca, can someone. So if we were engaged with someone who's not ready to move and have our own frustration because we don't we're not trained and don't know to help. Right. Can that person call the hotline and get mm -hmm. wisdom yes, so yes. then we know how to operate with our yes. family member or friend? Yes, absolutely. Um, and the hotline's answered 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 
in just about every language they can talk to people. Um, so they're a really good resource, and they, and they know where everything is available around the state as mm -hmm. well. Um, so I, I do think that that is always the advice as I tell people, just call the hotline and talk to them. And certainly from safety planning, I mean, that's the, the main thing that the hotline staff will, either re, they'll do it or they'll refer, refer them to an agency like us to really think about a safe way to leave. And, and the other piece is not judging them if they mm -hmm. leave and they go back. Mm -hmm. And w I can't tell you the number of times that we've had people come into the shelter um, mm -hmm. who have family, but their family basically said, I'm done with you. I've helped you three times. You went back three times. And not understanding, to Sarah's point, children are involved. We want to. I want to try to figure out how to make this work. Not to mention that you know we've seen this more than a ton of times. He'll generally say he's genuinely sorry. He generally wants to be different. Mm -hmm. But until he gets treatment, he or she is not going to be different. You know and. It's, if you remember um, in 2014, after the Ray Rice uh, mm. awful incident, mm -hmm. um, the Bears signed um, another kid, Ray McDonald, who had been, uh, had two domestic violence alleged incidents and two sexual assault alleged incidents in San Francisco. And uh, McCaskey signed him. And all hell broke loose in Chicago. <laughs> People were not going to buy tickets to go see the Bears because George had done this. And we had just learned, it, because of the Ray Rice incident, we got $200,000 from the Bears for our Chicago project because they wanted to put money into a high profile. They really wanted to be helpful, so they paid for our playground. And, for, for, and so this was like two weeks after we found out we were getting this money, and I'm like, eh. Now we can't go do a press release. <laughs> so I called Hallis Hall and I talked to the, the person who had given us the money and I said, I said, you know, I know that you're wanting to do the right thing for the team and he's a good player and you, you can help him by part of his contract could be that he gets treatment for this behavior. And she said, well, no, we can't force him to do that. I'm like, you're the Chicago Bears. You can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Well, literally two weeks later, my phone, and the, the media didn't let up on McCaskey. And he's a great guy, by the way. But they did not let up on him. And he calls me. Very bizarre. I'm walking out of my office, and somebody chases me. And they're like, George McCaskey's on the phone for you. And I'm like, that's random. <laughs> so I go back in. I'm like, yes, sir. And, <laughs> and so he says, are you mad at me for signing Ray McDonald? And I said, that's not my business, but I'll tell you what I told your staff. You need to require him to get help. He can get help, and he could be a better person and be a good player at the same time. And he explained that he, played, he, he said it was the Players Association, the, the unions, that wouldn't let them do it. And I said, well, I'm telling you. And he said he, he swore he wouldn't do it again. No, and I said, and, and an alcoholic will tell you right. that they won't drink again, but if they don't get treatment, they're going to drink again. And of course, they signed him. And within a month, he had gone back to California and beat up his girlfriend. And her mother called Illinois, uh, the California State Police on him. And that was the end of his career. And as, had they just gotten And if you watched what happened with the Cubs, they did differently with what was the player? Wilson, um, not Wilson. Um, no. Mm -mm. Russell. 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 Addison yeah. Russell. Wow. They did exactly what I said. They got him connected to treatment. And then they claimed he wasn't as good of a player when he came back. Well, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but anyway, they, they, the Cubs did actually get him treatment for Addison Russell. But. Sorry. I, I just went down a road. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't going to be helpful. <laughs> what are the barriers to breaking the cycle? Uh, Sarah, I'd really love to, to hear your thoughts. Some of the obstacles we're up against, why this is so yeah. hard. Yeah, I, I uh, definitely want to talk about this one. It's so easy for people that haven't been through it or they're on the outside, like, why don't you just leave? And you've already heard about the financial, you know, how hard that is, but um, it's it's so much more complicated than, than even just the financial because, like, the patterns that led someone to become abused are, are very, very, very powerful in keeping them in that situation. And so... Uh, one story that I wanted to tell um, that I think it displays this very well 
is um, I was in a group therapy session a few, several years ago, and I was I was talking about um, you know when, when I was married and and I would get injured that was it was severe enough that I, I wasn't able to walk, and so I had to get carried into the bathroom every day and just lay there for weeks. And someone said, "Oh my gosh, like why didn't you go to the hospital?" And in that session, I thought, "Oh, you know, like I had ne- it had never occurred to me in, in all those years and all all that time." Like why I never even thought about the hospital. It, it didn't even dawn on me. And and you know, like a fish that's swimming in water doesn't go around thinking, oh, I'm swimming in water. I'm swimming in water. Mm-hmm. And um, your sense of normalcy is like sometimes becomes so severe um, that. And I've seen this with other people in the shelter too. And I I took the training, the Illinois domestic violence training, and they teach this that um, when you're listening to someone's story, a lot of times they they won't present right away. Um, you know how bad it is because they don't really think it's that bad, and so one example is one of my good friends. Uh, her, her, she was talking. Oh, you know, he, we we argue a lot, and, and she was that this is the problem that we have is that we we argue a lot. And I'm like, well, that's normal, you know. Like, well, then like into the conversation, 20 minutes later, she casually mentioned you know something about a hospital, and I was like, wait a minute, back up. Like, what was that about? Oh, that you know when he threw the microwave on top of me, and it was like the side note, you know, and so. Um, I just I think that people underestimate like how how strong those um, uh, people's exposure to you know and their and their sense of normalcy um, also worth um, everything I did when I from the time I had kids was was only for my kids you know and it, it took losing a, a son for me to realize that you know I always thought I was absorbing all the abuse and that my kids are fine and I was doing the right thing mm. by they have a bed to sleep in they have a, a two parent home. And that I'm, I'll take all the crap, and and I'm do, I'm being a good mom, and and this is the right thing to do, until I, I you know, it was obvious that my my kids were in danger. Um, that's what propelled me to leave, but I would have never done that for myself. Mm. You know, I I didn't think I was worth anything. And going back to the story when I was in that therapy session talking about why did I didn't go to the hospital, it took me a long time. I had to stop and think. I'm like, why didn't I go to the hospital, or why didn't I think about going to the hospital? And I. And I thought, well, you know, what would have happened if I would have asked him for a ride to the hospital back then? I'm like, he would have just said, "Why? The, what a waste of gas money, you know? And so, like, I, I really, and I believed it was true, you know? Mm-hmm. So if you think that, like, $2 in gas is more valuable than your life, you're not going to fight really hard this uphill battle of taking on this monumental task of, like, you know, risking your life to leave and, and you know, put it in the grit that it takes to get an education. You're not going to do that if you don't think that you're you're worth it, you know? Mm. Sounds really powerful. It is powerful. How does how does one find self-worth, Sarah? Where did you find yours? That, that took a long time. That definitely was not overnight. And I, I was blessed to have my Wings family that walked with me from the time I came to the shelter and still to this day. And um, my church family, and I, I had a lot of good people in my life that, um, that loved me and that, that thought I was a, a good person and respected me. And um, it was hard to, for me to learn how to accept that, but over, over time, it takes time. Well, you, you spoke earlier about um, not only how long it takes to just find stability, but then once you find stability, that's when the trauma kicks yes. in. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you also talk about your nonprofit um, is hopefully going to serve that need, mm-hmm. right, of mm-hmm. being able to continue the support as these people are going through that and right. trying to find the self-worth, yeah. right? You talked a lot about um, the importance of community. Absolutely. And obviously you had the Wings family and your church family. Talk to us about the work that you've been doing um, when you go back to the shelters. Yeah, well, that, that's why I'm so driven to do it because because I, I just went through hell and, and then my, my life went from such one extreme to, to the other. Um, and I just, I know that, I'm like, you know, I don't have all the answers. I don't, I don't have, I, I was doing this back when I was still struggling myself, but I just, I just knew that like, sometimes just having another person's there that cares is so powerful. And I thought I can at least do that. I can at least show up and I can at least just be a friend, you know, mm-hmm. and be like, hey, you know, I've been through some stuff too and and I see you and I care and I, I wish I could fix it and I can't, but um, that's something everyone can do. And I, I don't think that you have to um, be able to identify with domestic violence in order to be those people. 
you know, the people that were supportive of me a lot, especially my church family, had different backgrounds than I did, and they just, um, just they just saw me as a human that was that was valuable, and that, and being on the receiving end of that taught me, and it changed me, and and I think we can all be that person for somebody, you know. That's beautiful. Well, and I want to add, you know, we, we talked briefly about Operation Shelter Cupid, but what it what it is, and it was her concept, and she allowed me to be a part of it, and I'm so honored, is she, after she graduated from Wings, saved up her money and took flowers to the women living in the, in the suburban safe house, in Wings Safe House. And then she started collecting money at church, and, and we helped be her financial account to hold the money for her. The Bears started kicking in money, all states started kicking in money, and on the on, on multiple days, she delivers roses to women and men living in shelters all over the Chicago land region. On Valentine's Day, I get to be her driver. Mm -hmm. And we we delivered on 13th oh, and 14th, 130 dozen roses. And then I did the 15th as well. And she did the 15th <laughs> as well. So that's Operation Shelter Cupid. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, when she goes in and she hands those roses oh. to these folks, they are in tears and they say, I, no one's no one's yeah. cared for me like this before. You know what? I want to say that this is off topic, but bringing up Operation Shelter Cupid, one of the things that people will say a lot too is that they don't they don't think they're for them. So it's like, why you know why do you think I would be trucking a whole thing of flowers in here on Valentine's Day, and and they'll just be expressionless and, and it's and I understand because I you know I used to be one of them, so I'm like I know you know they think that this is some community event that we're doing at the shelter of all places. And so you have to walk up to them and hand it and say, no, this is for you. And that's when that's when it's like, oh, you know, they they don't think that they're worth it. But I started doing that side note, like I was doing it for myself, you know, because I was so happy to be single on Valentine's Day because I love flowers, you know. <laughs> and and I was like, I can finally go get some flowers. It was like, this is great, you know. And, um, and I was just enjoying myself, you know, every year. And then finally, I just dawned on me, hey, you know, like I've been taking care of myself for a while. And I want to. I want to do something for them, and then just everybody. Everybody started helping, and it got huge. Amazing. The importance of community. Yeah, absolutely. Sarah, thank you for helping us see the personal obstacles and barriers, and the ways in which you have navigated and moved through them. Rebecca, what are the systemic obstacles and barriers that? Well, we could be here for a few days if you wanted me to go into all of them. <laughs> I already mentioned the courts earlier, um, but certainly I, I can tell you part of the, the piece of the 40-hour training that I do has to do, really is about the systemic power and control. So when someone picks up that phone to, to call, and if it's the police, it's one of the scariest calls in the world because you don't know, and it's the scariest call for the police, by the way, too. Hmm. It's the number one call in every ju jurisdiction that police respond to as a domestic call. Hmm. And it's the most scary one for them because it's the most unpredictable one. And when you read about police officers getting hurt, often it's because they, they're uh, responding to a domestic, especially if there's weapons involved. But in some communities, as we all know, people are very distrusting of law enforcement, mm -hmm. justifiably so. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to reach out for law enforcement for help. Um, and then it's a huge leap of faith that if you make that call that, you know, and, and we've been working to in d different jurisdictions and, then, and depending on the police chiefs, they have great trainings and others don't in how they respond. Um, but you have a good law enforcement, re enforcement response, that's great. And then it goes to court and you're trying to get an order of protection. You have to hope like hell that that goes well. Because, like I said, you may have you may get a, a judge who asks you what you did to provoke them, and there's the societal thing. When the Rihanna thing happened, if you remember, mm -hmm. when Chris Brown beat her up and TMZ broke the story and showed her face, this is what was said on all the media outlets: she must be so embarrassed. They didn't say he, not even CNN. All of them, every single reporter said she must so embarrassed, and she said. I'm so embarrassed that that picture's out there. Yeah. Now, Chris Brown, just you know, did go through the 52-week program in California, and he did apologize to her. He didn't stop being a jerk to people, but he did apologize to her. But that's the, that's the type of stuff that people don't realize, that you're not just battling the thing that's in your home. You're, you're having to leave and go to the unknown. And when people walk in our door at Wings, 
it's completely blind faith mm. that they're going to be taken care of. 100%. And if you think about how scary that is, mm -hmm. you're picking up your kids and you're walking out the door. This is what the Ukrainians are dealing with right now, right? They're mm -hmm. packing a bag and they're crossing the border and they have no idea what's going to happen next. And that is very, very scary. And so, you know, you talk about worse and, you know, part of what, what we try to do at Wings and so do our sister agencies is to create a beautiful, comfortable space. And we're one of the homes that we had an older home. So we try to make all of our facilities beautiful, clean, pictures on the wall, feel like a home. And we had a home in Park Ridge that an older couple had donated and then gave us money but wouldn't let us use the money to <laughs> renovate it. And it was getting older and older and older. And when they passed away, I, and she lived in that home, and she's like, that home was horrible. I'm like, I know it was horrible, <laughs> but they wouldn't let us fix it up. Um, when that couple passed away, I asked their daughters, can we can you use the money? So now it's completely gutted, and it's a brand new house inside. She's like, when am I going to get to yeah, see it? I'm okay, like, you won't even it. think it's the same house. <laughs> but the issue comes down to money. And, resource. and what that does, before I go into that, is it, it tells them that we care about them. We care enough about you to have a beautiful place for you to live, good food for you to eat. Mm -hmm. By the way, we also took yummy food on to the Suburban Safe House and the, yeah. our Wings Metro Safe House and had dinner with Valentine's them. And, and they love you know, getting special food from outside. But we have chefs at both of our safe houses that cook nutritious meals for them, if we have somebody who has dietary needs, whatever they need when they come in the door, we give to them. And everybody's different and everybody needs something different. Mm -hmm. And if they say, I don't want to talk to you for three days, then we let them sit in their room and they don't talk to us for three days because that's what they need. Most organizations, and we work really hard to raise the money. For those of them who have known Wings for a long time, you know, we, we've opened resale stores, we've done every thing you could do to, to bring in money. And all in, we get less than 25% of our money is from the government. And we're fighting right now to get more money from the state because we've gotten about this much from the state the entire time. We get the least of any other domestic violence program in, this, in the state. Um, but it, it comes down to resources. And a lot of the organizations can't raise the money to make their facilities beautiful. Right, yeah. and, and Sarah's seen this. Like We've gone into other shelters, and people have said, can you get me into Wings? Mm -hmm. Because the shelter they're living in is, is dingy. Dilapidated. Sometimes. And, and it's just an old building that that agency can't get the capital resources to gut it and, and make it beautiful again. It's a human dignity thing. It is. Yeah. It is. So, I mean, that's, you know, when, when we're when we're doing our fundraising and we're talking about, you know, why we need the money, you know, and certainly to be able to pay the staff to take care of them. Um, a lot of people don't know in our industry that currently our staff are being paid less than if they worked at McDonald's. And that's a resource issue. And so we're trying to, to get the state to give us, to give DV more money altogether so that agencies across the state can, can pay their staff thriving wages. Um, that's what we're trying to do for our clients, but we aren't able to do it for our own staff. So there's a lot of um, hurdles, you know, and balls in the air all the time for trying to provide the best possible services, continual feedback from the clients that, that we're trying to help, um, and incorporating that feedback into what we do, um, but, and, and helping other agencies do the same thing, um, but it's, it, it takes money and it takes resources to make it happen. Um, one thing that we have been very grateful, and Barrington's been a huge part of this the whole time you know, I've been at Wings, um, is the donations that we get. So the diapers, the laundry detergent, the toilet paper. Um, Tabitha, we have one staff person who collects that, and she brings in a million dollars. This is outside of our stores, a million dollars a year in donated stuff that goes directly to the clients. And they can continue to come to the pantry after they graduate so that they can save money mm -hmm. instead of spending their money on stuff like that. So I mean there's the you know, kind of the other tangents and variables of, of what it what goes into all the pieces that it is that it truly takes a village to help someone go from here to here and then continue to support them onward. And then have her, people like her, come and give back. Uh, so f clearly the financial need is huge and um, and there's a, and also a barrier to being able to provide the services. And like you said, I think 
pointing out the human dignity behind mm -hmm. being in a place that feels like home is really important. Have you run into resistance in communities with regards to shelters and things like that? Is that also Never. A, a barrier? <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they got a kick out of it. And, and Joe and my friend Laura were front and center. When we went to build our, our safe house uh, in the suburbs, um, the municipality it was in, we had to go, had the, the property rezoned for special use. Um, and we expected, you know, some NIMBY, not in my backyard. And it was insane. And with the zoning hearings, twice I had to be escorted out by the police chief because some of the neighbors threatened to kill me if we went forward with the project. I mean, it was, it was really bad. And we had a lot of support. We started with 105 people against us and we whittled it down to five. And one of those was a teacher who I finally flipped. And I called her and I said, you know, this is gonna help people, it's a good thing. And, and, she, and she said, well, I don't want anything there. And I said, well, what if they put a school there? She's like, I don't want a school there. I don't want anything there. And I'm like, but you're a teacher. And so we fi I finally came up with the acronym BANANA, which is build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. <laughs> and um, other people have adopted that acronym because it's far worse than NIMBY. Because um, I mean, certainly we had the people who were next to us. It would have been in their backyard, but it was nowhere near the other people who were against it. But um, it was a very, very tough zoning battle, and we we won the first time. We were, and then I had a baby, and uh, eight days later, and then we were sued, <laughs> and then we were sued, and the project stopped, which was good because then I had six months to spend with the baby. Um, he he, there was no maternity. We were at Rita Canning's house, 24 hours after we left the hospital, but. Um, trying to figure out a strategy against this lawsuit. But anyway, it was, it, it was just interesting, and, and people don't realize that. There's, you know, Clearbrook, who helps developing disabled people, they get the banana all the time. Now, why, to me, I just, maybe it's because of the work I do. I just cannot imagine not having compassion to have a group home for developing disabled adults in your neighborhood. But it's, people don't like change. People are afraid that they're, Basement's gonna flood is the big one, which cracks me up. I'm like, why is building this building gonna make your basement flood? But oh well. Um, but you know, the, the, and you know, Sarah met with the mayor of Hoffman Estates today to to fight for a zoning issue on something our church is working on, and and that's a good town to do in it because he's reasonable. But um, I, I wonder because I remember you telling me before that one of the concerns people had was they thought the crime rate would go up, and it didn't. But one of the things that I'm that I'm really passionate about is that. Um, you know, when, when people are highly traumatized and they don't have support around them, you know, maybe there, there could be issues, but that's why it's so important to embrace these types of organizations and embrace the actual people if they're in your neighborhood because we never had crime issues over at um, my old shelter. And, and they Well, the interesting thing is I can't divulge a location, um, but there's a church that's not far, that's really close. And when we were doing the zoning hearings, um, I asked the police chief because they were one of their main objections was that the police would be there all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and in the neighborhood. And, we, and this is not in a neighborhood; it's in more of a uh, commercial quarter. And um, but then there's residential behind it. But anyway, um, they were concerned about the police coming, and so I asked the chief to pull the statistics for uh, police calls to this church. And it was like 62 per month or something to the church. And I'm like, I bet we can beat that. <laughs> and we, we didn't. We never uh, had the, the police there except for if we were concerned, uh, if we had, the, if the client inside had a safety concern or had something that they needed help with. But that's the, the benefit of Wings is, is the organization like, per, like surrounds that person and, and helps them. And, and that really mitigates, I think, when people are alone without that organizational support and they're really suffering, that's when there's problems, but, yeah. What do you want, because we're gonna open for questions in a bit, so continue to think of your questions online and in the room, but in the, in the beginning we said, go from this night, not necessarily repeating the stories, but repeating the lessons you've learned Sarah and Rebecca, what do you hope we've learned tonight? What do you hope people walk away online or in the room knowing and willing to say? I hope that people feel 
equipped to um, to be supportive of, of their neighbors and their friends. I, I'm really big on the community part. So I know she needs money. Money's very important. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to need money, too. Yeah, I, it's true. I'm going to need it now. i got to start thinking like that, guys. Um, <laughs> but um, that's, will help you with. Yeah, that's my, that's my biggest thing is I just... You know, I'm just like I'm just really big on seeing just seeing people as human and not necessarily looking at them as um, you know uh, someone who's who's so far different. They might have very different experiences, but I've just been I've been so like impacted by people who were you know Barring Barrington Servanites maybe very different than me and just and loved me and and it healed me. You know, so so let's hold that because that loved me and healed me. Those are like parts of a coin. You need both <laughs> for it to have work. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. What do you want us to know? What do you want? Somebody's going to ask these folks, what'd you do Wednesday night? What'd you learn Wednesday night? I, I would echo what Sarah said. I think the main thing is what Sarah said earlier is not to judge. Mm -hmm. Not to, you haven't walked a minute in their shoes. Mm -hmm. So not to judge the situation, to be as empathic as you can. Um, speaking to the, the love thing, one of my internships in California was with at a school for all the kids who had been kicked out of every other school in mm -hmm. Silicon Valley because they were so violent. And the reason they were all violent was because they had all been physically abused and most of them sexually abused. And so that was their way of responding to the world. And we as staff decided it was our job to love them back to normal. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. Mm. That's right. And no matter what a kid, and I had it multiple times, with mm -hmm. one would come right up to my face and tell me to go F myself. And my job was to love them through that moment. And the more that we can do that for humans, I mean, you see all this road rage and you see just all this rage in general yeah. in the world today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly surfing its, showing its face in Ukraine right now in the worst way. But the more that you can, if someone's acting bizarre or they're being mean, I, I had this happen at the meat counter at Mariano's. A kid was just being really rude and, and nasty to customers. And I just said to him, I'm like, are you having a bad day? Mm. And he, his whole demeanor changed. And he was like, I'm having a horrible day. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can really tell you're having a horrible day. What, you know, do you want to talk about it? And he's like, no, just something went on at home. He goes, but I need to just let it go and, and get to do my job. Totally different person to the next customer. But other people were responding to his negativeness with their own negativeness, and that just snowballs. So I think that that you know, is the one thing you know, that we've tried to teach our children is that to not judge. If someone is acting a certain way, assume that something bad's going on in their life. And they're taking it out on you. And you can just re reflect back to them that you recognize that, that, that something's wrong and they're having a bad day. Or say nothing and leave it alone. But I think, um, you know, certainly just by being here, present in the room and, and on streaming, shows that you care about people and the human condition, and that means a lot. And if we could just get everybody in the universe doing that, <laughs> wings could turn into a bed and breakfast, we could go sit on the beach, yes. we wouldn't have to worry about this anymore. <laughs> that would be the ideal thing. And, and, it, and it truly is the truth. I always say that, that my number one business goal is to be out of business. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, if people just treated each other with love and respect, we wouldn't need to exist. You know, to that point, I admire so much Sarah um, and and what you have done. And when you told us in the pre-call um, how no matter what, you still looked at your ex-husband um, as human yeah. and with compassion, even even in moments of hatred and anger. I yeah. So when I was still married, that I always did. Um, which that's, there's some real complex emotional and psychological things that go on there when you are very attached to someone who abuses you. But yeah. um, but I did un, I did see that you know that he was a very broken person and had a lot of suffering of his own. And um, I went through a stage of, of absolute hate after my son passed away. Um, and but I came back. You know I, I came back or I was able to um, forgive him and. I, I want to be careful with saying that because you don't want to ever 
like push someone and or that's everyone's own journey, yep. right? And it takes time if they if they want to do that. But um, I was never able to to be around him anymore because it wasn't safe. But um, I always hoped the best for him. Um, he passed away, but I I don't have any negative feelings or thoughts about him. I actually just was able to let go and, and have compassion on him. That, um, I know you are a woman of faith, and uh, what you just said defines forgive. Yeah. And in a theological concept, forgive simply means drop the baggage. Mm -hmm. It simply means let go. And, and I would argue just seeing people as, as human. It's like we, sometimes when you hate, if you hate somebody, you know, it, de it dehumanizes them, mm -hmm. and, and you see them as just a, a detestable thing, you know. But when you, when you see someone as just, as just a very broken person that's acting out of their own pain and their mm -hmm. own problems, um, even when they've done something that bad to you, um, you know, it's possible. You know? yeah. One of my professors a long time ago uh, said, be water to rock. Water always wins. Mm -hmm. And so water can flow over around, past, and look at the Grand Canyon. <laughs> Water always wins. Um, so you flowed past and into this other place yeah. uh, and maybe shifted some of him in the process, but, but you, this living water, kept going. So. It's beautiful. So. You have another question? I don't want to go. Okay. No. They're virtually, you are invited to put your questions in the chat, and our sister Claire will capture them. Um, you are part of this as if you were in the room. We feel your spirit. If you are in the room, there are cards on your table, and you are welcome to um, indicate your question. Beloved, we are going to hold these in confidential manners, so we're not going to use your names, um, so that you are welcome to indicate any question. There are experts in the room, <laughs> uh, and we want to be sure that this night uh, blesses if there are questions here. You have the first one in your hand. I do. So are we ready to get going already? Yeah. Sure. OK. So um, the question is, any suggestions for men talking with other men? Mm. Are there healing circles, anti-violence efforts? What are the best practices for prevention? This is a multi-pronged question, clearly. That's good, though. Um, kind of all ties together. What can men allies do? That is a very awesome question. Mm -hmm. First, yes, men should talk to other men um, and hold them accountable for the behavior and, and not repeating it. And yes, as I said earlier, there is treatment and there's some really good programs in Chicago. Uh, the Center for Advancing Domestic Peace um, is one of the best probably in, in the country and people go there voluntarily to get, to get help. Um, and I believe they do have healing circles. Um, those are really important. Again, calling the hotline you can get answers to all of those resources. Um, but I, it is important um, for men to support each other, too. I mean, if, if a, male, a man sees another man doing something, to not just call them out on it, but ask them if they need help and, and guide them to that help. Um, because what they have found, there's also a great program. Uh, it used to be at St. Pius Church, but it's primarily uh, Latino men who flock to it, and they have a waiting list all the time. They're wanting to to go. They don't want to lose their families. They don't want to lose their wives, and they go voluntarily to to the uh, to get counseling and support uh, to unlearn the behavior and to learn new ways to be in relationship with their partner. So I think it, it is critical, and there are many men who have jumped into the movement. Um, I think when the feminist movement started and, and this whole... Uh, Me too. Well, it, that, I mean, you heard men... Uh, what I started to say is that when the feminist movement started, men were shut out. Mm. They were... All men were created horribly equal. And um, that's not true. We know that's not true. So, um, and there were many... When I started at Wings 23 years ago, there were many organizations, domestic violence organizations, who did not let men in the building, ever. Wings didn't used to. 
in the beginning, or allow, allow men volunteers. Well, and then we found um, Ted. Yeah. Ted was great. <laughs> Ted was awesome. Um, but w when we changed that so that a lot of the, we have a lot of boys that come in. Sarah came in with two boys. We have others that come in with older boys. Mm -hmm. And for the clients, the adults, to see the good men. Mm -hmm. You know, to see what healthy relationships yeah. look like, right? I mean, that's really, really important. Plus, we have invited a lot of men to be on our board. There are a lot of domestic violence organizations that won't. And that's very short-sighted, you know, because the, the other piece of what we do when you talk about prevention, the best way you can do prevention is to, to give these kids counseling, hers at a very young age, and, get, and teach them healthy relationships their whole life. And that's the best prevention you can do, is, is getting them out of the situation and then, and then showing them what healthy looks like. You know, it's like if you only grew up in a certain neighborhood on the south side of Chicago and you never went anywhere else, right. you don't know what anything else looks like. And that happens, by the way. Um, so, the, you know, that's, I think, really, really, really important. I'm glad someone asked that question. Cause I want to add to that. Good. Um, they asked for advice if men talk to other men. One uh, easy thing to remember that you can always keep in your back pocket that might equip you in these conversations is just to understand that, uh, that domestic abuse is based on control. So it's, it's not based on someone having um, emotional problems or, I mean, that can be involved in it, but that when you understand the core issue is controlling another person, you can recognize it better and you can, you can maybe navigate those conversations better and help the, the abuser to understand what's going on. This is a question about um, Lake County or Cook County holding a summit where court police, social agencies, churches, funders gather to interface with one another and seek solutions. Has that kind of thing occurred? Well, first of all, Cook County and Lake County don't do anything together. <laughs> Cook, Cook China takes over its own life, you know, and Barrington, obviously, and other, other communities along the county line are unique in that you have that crossover between the two counties. It's an excellent idea, um, you know, just simply would require some convening. There are some, uh, some of those things that have gone on, like at Harper College has hosted some things, but again, it typically ends up being more Cook County and not a yeah. crossover of Lake County. Certainly something worth exploring. Um, we do have um, Judge Paul Pavlis, who's in Skokie, is a Barrington resident, um, and he, he would be a great speaker at something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely something we'll take back to, uh, talk with our other agencies. And certainly, I think, I know that the mayors would be for it of all of the Barringtons. And um, I always laugh when I say all the Barringtons. But, um, and, you know, the other areas around here, I, I believe the, the police chiefs would be very supportive. Um, and we do have some judges in the Rolling Meadows Courthouse um, who would be supportive. And we would have others who would say it's absolutely not necessary. Okay, I had a good one and I just lost it. Are there things we can do to help change the requirement in Illinois to extend the counseling program? The abuser treatment? Yes. It has to be legislated. So, so what does that mean? We lobby? We lobby. And what does that look like? Oh, I can show you what that looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm full deep in it right now trying to get the state to just raise the dollar amount to 50 million. Um, Historically, there have been some efforts to change it, um, the, to change two things. One, to make Illinois victimless prosecution like California is, where charges are automatically filed. The resistance has come from victims um, and other victim providers stating that that would take away their power. And I don't know how you feel about it, but my stance is always you're not taking power away from somebody who doesn't have it. Mm. You're, you're protecting them. Yeah, yeah. When, but when you are not having power, you really grab for it in any way yeah. you can sometimes. So yeah. I can understand. Yeah, They want to have a choice, but but sometimes they're going to be threatened and manipulated by the abuser, so you necessarily yeah. don't want them to have a choice in that right. case. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the other, in terms of increasing that, um, Illinois historically has more underfunded in Illinois, it's called partner interview, partner abuse intervention programs have been grossly underfunded. Um, in fact, they're always the first thing that gets cut. 
and we try to say if you, although there is a lot of money through uh, CARES Act and ARPA that came through to uh, fund agencies that help uh, people who harm is what they say. So to, for the obvious reason that you teach them to stop harming. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, right now there's more money that's gone into it, but um, there would need, to, the lobbying efforts would have to be 52 weeks and more money to pay for it. Now in California, the abusers um, that came, that were court mandated, and the courts have to agree too. That's the big thing, is getting all of those systems to work together the right way and get the bias out of the courtrooms, um, which will be a huge, huge hurdle. Um, but if we can, and, and we're fighting multiple battlefronts too that we don't even have time to go into with child custody and the children being given to the abusers all the time, and that's a chronic, chronic problem in, in particularly in Cook County. But, um, you know, it's, it's something that's there and, it, and we're going to tackle it, um, but we have to do like several things in parallel to make it happen. There's a question about getting involved with Dinamis House oh. and about, and with WINGS. How can we get involved directly in assisting with your programs? Dyn Dynamis House. Dynamis is the Greek word for power, by the way. Um, the, the website is in its infancy. There's not much up there yet, but I do have a website and there's an email list that you can sign up for. So it's now that I've got the approval for the 501c3, now I'm going to start moving forward very fast. It's dynamishouse.org. And I know it will be posted for our online friends and you'll be able to find it on our website as we follow up. Checks are welcomed. Yes. 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 <laughs> Checks are welcomed. <laughs> and for wings. And just and Sarah uh, is allowing me to be on her board for Dynamis House mm -hmm. so that you know certainly um, in my tenure we've had to raise a lot of money and go through zoning hearings and construction so um, I'm actually consulting with a couple of other organizations on a project they want to do as well, but you know, just sharing, we'll be sharing all of our lessons learned um, on her project and promoting it for fundraising. And, and obviously, you know, we're constantly fundraising. I mean, you have to be. Um, certainly, I mean, the blessing and the curse of not getting state funding is when the state doesn't pay. It doesn't really hurt us as much as it does yeah. other organizations. Um, but that's why we keep our government down and and as we've been talking and she's kind of watched me struggle with the government yeah. money and she's like I don't want the government money I don't want the government control okay <laughs> well <laughs> yeah so and, and and a lot of times you go get the government money out of necessity because you can't right. raise enough money in the private sector um, so you know again I would reiterate that Barrington has been one of the most supportive organization uh, villages and communities for wings over the years um, not just having a home here in the community, but um, you know, Sarah lived here. We've had other graduates live here, um, and and anytime I need something, I call my friends in Barrington, and they always right there, and we have what we need. So you know, I I just can't say enough. This is one of the most uh, generous and caring communities of of all that we do business in, and so you know, I just want to say thank you for all the years of support. Wingsprogram.com. <laughs> Wings program. <laughs> there you have it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have a. Yes, I have a. Um, we make a great team. We do. Um, a question: How can we, the community members, educators, and friends, be more responsive to young domestic violence victims? Oh, okay. I have, I have a coda, but I'll wait. Okay. I got excited. Sorry. You want me to take it? Minors. Right. Yeah. The the advantage, I, I guess. I'm not. I haven't been an expert in dealing with minor, intervening with minor situations, but there they are minors, and you, um, if there is abuse going on, then you can, like, step in. Someone will step in, um, unless it's like the dating. You know, the dating relationships where it's just control and emotional. That's a little bit more hazy, but um, if someone's being, you know, violently attacked and they're a minor, you've got a little bit more ability to do something about it, and I'm trying to think back, you know, when I was a minor, if, what would have helped me in the nonviolent situations? Again, just the um, um, just coming around them and just f forming a relationship with them. If they're if they're tolerating, you know, poor treatment and and their boyfriends telling them how stupid and worthless they are and 
controlling them. I mean, that person obviously has very low self-worth, and so that friendship and that speaking into them can, can mitigate. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not, like Sarah, I'm not sure if they're talking about a minor who's being abused by an adult, which there's mandated reporters. Mm -hmm. So if they tell a teacher or hospital personnel, then DCFS is automatically called. If it's teen dating violence, um, often we will call the hotline, still call the hotline. Um, teens can get orders of protection too. Um, the schools then have the dilemma of having to keep those students apart, but that's their responsibility. Um, I think the big issue is, is for teen dating violence, it is more the isolation and the verbal abuse, um, and usually the parents will see it and get the, the, the minor into counseling you know, to, to get help. Um, in some cases, I've seen one parent call the other parent, mm -hmm. um, but really calling the hotline and getting expert advice before taking any action is what I would suggest. The reason I got excited is because this question was, what can be done? Do you know programs that have been implemented in high schools to really educate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and which ones are successful, and are there any locally here in Barrington? Actually, in Barrington High School, uh, Safe Place out of Waukegan comes and does groups at Barrington High School. We... Um, we haven't had the funding to do it. It is part of our strategic plan to do it. Interestingly, 20 years ago, we were trying to go to the schools just to talk in the health classes about it, and the superintendents wouldn't let us in. Mm -hmm. And the reason they wouldn't let us in is because of what I just said, is if, if it's revealed that one student's hurting another student, then they have the obligation of keeping them apart. They'd rather not even bury my head in the sand and pretend like it doesn't exist so they don't have to deal with the liability. Well, guess what? You're going to deal with the liability anyway. But um, so there's a program called uh, uh, Between Friends who does really good programming with teens, mostly in the city. Um, there's a, we used to, as part of the Illinois Coalition, I chair the marketing committee. We had funding for many years from Verizon to do a teen dating video contest. So, and Barrington High School would always win because they have a state-of-the-art video studio, studio in the high school. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but we also had downstate schools that won. Kids just did them on their um, yeah. cell phones, but it was teens saying to teens, this is, this is what abuse looks like mm -hmm. for us, and this is what love looks like mm -hmm. for us, what healthy relationships. And they, they listen to each other far more than they would listen to me. And so we use that as a mechanism. We still promote those videos that the teens made, but and Verizon pr provided all the prizes, so iPhones and things like that. But Verizon stopped funding it, so the, the project ended. But um, someone wants a, a report card for judges. Like, can there be a domestic violence score so that you know who to vote for? That doesn't exist. Um, however, I would tell you, Mike. Bischoff have wanted to, to use some of the money from the Cindy Bischoff Fund to fund, a, there is a court watch program that is done where like, people who are going in to see what judges are doing will go in and then take a report. You're not allowed, as you know, to take a cell phone into, mm -hmm. or and if you do, you better have it off and hidden. Um, I think for that very reason that they don't want to be videotaped <laughs> or audio taped. Um, and again, there are many good judges, many, many good judges, so I, I don't want to, to paint a broad stroke. But it is certainly something that we've tried to do. Um, I've, you obviously all know that the judges are rated by the Bar Association. Mm -hmm. And there are judges who have gotten reelected even though the Bar Association has recommended them not to be reelected. So I think as much as possible as people can pay attention to what the Bar Association is saying about judges um, when you're going to, and know who your judges are when you're going to vote. That's the key issue. Um, but, and certainly, I, Mike wanted to start something that was like a Yelp for judges, <laughs> that when you walked out of the courtroom, you could rate the judge like on this <laughs> Yelp platform. And I don't remember why it never took off, but, but I, we certainly can do that. Rebecca, um, I have a question that is asking about the domestic violence um, training, but I, I'm, I'm a l I just want to clarify. Did you say that there was some kind of domestic violence training for judges? There is not. Okay, because okay. that was the question was, 
If they do was. get, I think they get a few hours of training in their initial training when they first become elected. Okay. And then they go to, everybody goes straight to traffic court. Okay. And there's no continuing education? I have to take continuing education as a minister. They're the only profession that in Illinois that is not required to take for continuing education. We got more lobbying to do, friends. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Um, okay, I have another question here. I'm out, so keep going. Okay. <laughs> On the subject of training, uh, this person is curious about uh, what domestic violence training the Barrington Police does, and do you have an answer to that? I don't believe they do any that I'm aware of, but that's not unusual. Okay. That's not unusual that, that I mean, they do, I, I should take that back. When I say training, we used to do, um, before we lost the funding, we had staff that would go to court calls for rolling on Monday morning for Rolling Meadows, Schaumburg, Hoffman, and we do training at those Monday morning roll calls where all the officers were there around domestic violence and what to do when they go out on a call, and and that kind of went away when the funding went away. Um, and not all jurisdictions are open to any training at all, um, but most are if you have the money. So we're working on getting some funding uh, in Hoffman Estates where we both live. I sit on the Fire and Police Commission because I'm not busy enough, um, the mayor asked me. You know. um, but we are trying to get some funding to, and that's what we're gonna do is, is train the officers and also equip them with uh, a, a, a tablet so when they do go out, they, can, they don't have to be the expert in domestic violence and, and helping the victim, but they can, can get her in the car or him and connect them to one of our staff at the safe house to do safety planning and figure out what's the best, which is what we do at the hospitals. Whenever we're called to do a bedside, we, we don't go into Sarah's Point and tell them what they need to do next. Mm -hmm. We ask them what they want to do next. And the, the police officers could do the same thing. We're piloting this model in Hoffman, and if it's successful, we're gonna take it to other municipalities if we can get the funding. That will truly help the officers, one, feel safer, mm -hmm. two, and we have a follow-up mechanism, which that is what most jurisdictions do have that I don't believe Barrington has as a police social worker. Um, so like in, in Palatine, when the police do go out and respond to a domestic, um, immediately uh, a police social worker follows up and does safety planning and, and counseling and just support and, and lets the victim decide what they wanna do next. So, That's but I don't know that Barrington has any like ongoing training. Okay. Um, so the last question that I have here is um, wanting to understand the impact that COVID, COVID has had on domestic violence. Um, what, what is staying it? At home. What's the impact, Joe? What has it been? <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> um, it's been, and, and I'm glad someone asked that because I, I didn't even, it's just been so horrible. I, I, you just can't even, I can't even tell you. In the, the years I've been doing this, I had never seen the calls be as high as they've been and the violence be as severe as it's been. So the number of people that we've seen, not just us, but in, in summer of 20, uh, the, the, hotline, uh, the hotline, the statewide hotline got a significant amount of money from the state to put people in hotels. So we were able to, to take people, our shelter was empty because we had to empty it out um, for safety reasons and they were in hotels. And then the state was giving us more money to put people in hotels. and to keep people safe. Uh, you know, physically safe from COVID and physically safe from violence at the same time. Um, but what we also saw, partic particularly in Chicago, the number of people coming straight from the hospital, mm -hmm. amp amped up, mm -hmm. and the number of incidents that involve gun violence. So in Chicago, the number of domestic homicides between 2019 and 21 tripled. And I think they said 75% of those were people who had never called the police for help, and they were dead. And the Chicago police were res responding to a significant number of greater calls. And at one point uh, last year, there was a two-month period where there was not one shelter bed available in the state of Illinois for two months. And so we were begging the state to give us more money to put people in hotels, so because what those what happened was those people were just forced to stay where they were, and you know the. It was the governor repeatedly talked about how for victims of domestic violence, lockdown was the worst thing that could happen to you because, and to the children too, who couldn't go to school. They were, not only were they not going to school and subject to their own abuse, but they're watching the abuse happen right in front of them. 
So the, as the kids were coming in, the level of trauma that they were coming in with was just very heavy. And we've had a hard time keeping staff because the staff are just like, this is too hard. I can't do this, especially for what the pay is. So you know, we've been, we did lobby the state. We were successful in getting hazard pay. So we've been able to give the shelter staff uh, an extra paycheck every month on top of their regular pay for hazard pay, which will run out in June. But um, it, it's, it doesn't appear to be slowing down um, at all. And so that's why um, we were successful in lobbying uh, the mayor of Chicago to, to invest an additional 25 million in domestic violence services in, in Chicago. It has been only 10 million forever, um, which is one of the worst in the country, by the way. And um, their response in Chicago has, has been really horrible, but we got an extra 25 million. So we turned right around and, and went to the state and said, you're only doing 21 million and you haven't up that since 2009, so we think you should do 50 million. And that's what our lobbying is right now, is we have everybody we know calling their legislator, their senator, their, their rep, the governor's office, and saying you need to fund domestic violence at 50 million. I don't know what we'll get, but it's, it's silly that we wouldn't Are there some there. instructions on your website so that residents here might join that lobbying effort? It's on our social media, on our Facebook page. Okay. Um, it's real, it's actually very simple, and we have a script and everything that you can use. That's gonna be huge if we can get that. It would, it would allow WINGS and other agencies to actually be able to pay our staff a real wage um, and keep them, the professional staff that we're, that we're needing to do the work. Are there other questions? So, um, if there's still a card on your table or uh, in, in your phone, I want you to make yourself a note. Tonight, I felt called to. I don't really care what your answer is. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if we can sit here and not be moved by Sarah's strength and power, So tonight I feel called to pray could be an answer, in case you don't have another one. <laughs> and I want you to put that note somewhere where you see it. Nobody's going to ever know, and we're not going to ever ask you. But I pray, I pray that it inspire you. So I tried an acronym based on what I heard tonight. This could fall flat, but I'm going <laughs> to <laughs> So if you still have room to write, the acronym is JUSTICE. Because it seems to me what we're seeking is justice for perpetrators and survivors. So here's what justice means based on what I heard tonight. Judge not. Unite for change. Stay present. Take time to listen. Invite their truth. Call for information. And everybody can change. <laughs> It's almost as good as banana. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is it. But, <clears throat> but that moves us toward a place where Rebecca can go sit on the beach <laughs> because there's no more domestic violence. The army is in front of me. Let's go out and win this one. <laughs> good night, everybody. Thank you so much, Sarah and Rebecca. You are amazing. Oh, yeah. Checks are welcome. <laughs> you weren't called to do anything else.
Huge, huge thank you, Sarah, for sharing your story. We are so thrilled that you are thriving and your family is thriving. And Rebecca, thank you for being here and doing the work that you do. You two make an amazing team. Amen. We should go on the road. Yeah. On the road. <laughs> on One the more road. round of applause. Everybody. <laughs> See you next month. Thank you, everyone.